Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. This is Biology 205 at Illinois Central College. We are about to dive into Chapter 4, The Tissue Level of Organization. In today's lecture, the learning outcomes will include to review the material from Lab 5 in your lab packet, and then to describe the functions of epithelial tissues and how to classify them. And you're going to be able to contrast simple, stratified, pseudostratified, and transitional epitheliums. And you'll be able to contrast squamous, cuboidal, and columnar epithelia. You'll also describe the characteristics of epithelial tissue and identify the different types of epithelial tissue visually or by description and be able to predict a location of that particular tissue. You'll be able to compare the cellular connections that are involved. This includes CAMs, tight junctions, desmosomes, hemidesmosomes, gap junctions, and glucose immunoglycans. You'll contrast the structures of endocrine and exocrine glands and describe the different types of secretions, including merocrine, apocrine, holocrine, serous mucus, and mixed exocrine. Also, you'll be able to contrast the difference between unicellular and multicellular glands, and you'll be able to review multicellular glands, but there's no assessment for that specifically. You'll also list the functions of connective tissue and classify connective tissues according to their structural characteristics of the matrix. You'll be able to contrast loose and dense connective tissues. You'll be able to compare the ground substances of different connective tissues and contrast connective tissue fibers, including collagen, reticular, and elastic. You'll also be able to identify cells of connective tissue. This includes fibroblast, macrophages, adipocytes, melanocytes, lymphocytes, erythrocytes, chondrocytes, and osteocytes. And you'll be able to identify the different types of loose connective tissue visually or by description, and provide a location of that tissue for the following, for areolar tissue, adipose tissue, or reticular tissue. Lastly, you'll be able to identify the different types of dense connective tissue visually or by description, and provide a location of that tissue for dense regular, dense irregular, and elastic. And you'll also be able to identify the different types of cartilage connective tissue visually or by description, and be able to provide a location of that tissue. This includes hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage. You'll also be able to identify the different types of fluid connective tissue visually or by description, and be able to identify the cells. So this includes erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets. You will be able to identify and describe osseous tissue. You'll be able to justify the presence of lacuna in bone and cartilage, and name the cells that are occupying the lacuna in each, respectively and describe the basics of muscle tissue, the structure, and be able to visually and descriptively differentiate between the three different types of muscle. Now, you're going to cover that in a lot more depth when you go into ANP2 next semester. And then you'll be able to identify the function of the nervous system and differentiate between the neuron and neuroglia, and explain the characteristics of the four types of membranes, mucus, serous, cutaneous, and synovial. No lecture of mine would be complete without some pop quiz questions along the way. So before we get started, a group of similar cells with a similar function is a or an organ, tissue, organism, or organ system. You can probably guess it's tissue because that's the name of the title of our subject today, but it's also something that you learned in the last chapter as well. Our lecture today will follow the format of your textbook for ease of you being able to jump in and out of the lecture and to pick up your book and put it down at different points and stay organized. So first off, let's start off with a broad 30,000 foot view looking at the four main tissue types. In the previous chapter, we discussed cells and cellular biology, but that's not the end of the story. Cells interact with their environment with extracellular materials and fluids, and together, a bunch of cells that have the same function will become a tissue. So the four main types of tissues are epithelial tissues, connective tissues, muscular tissues, and nervous tissues. So epithelial tissues are going to be covering most of our exposed surfaces of our body, ranging from our skin to our larynx, and they'll do all sorts of different things to protect us, such as producing glandular secretions. Our connective tissues are basically going to fill up all the spaces where something else isn't, and in doing so, it provides some structural support to our overall body. It's also a site of energy storage, particularly when we talk about adipose tissue. Now, muscular tissue, of course, everybody is familiar with. It allows us to move by contracting. There are three different types of that, and we'll get into that later. 
And then lastly, nervous tissue. This is going to be the type of tissue that allows us to think and to contract action potentials throughout our body, which will stimulate muscles to move. So nervous tissue is essentially important for carrying information. So together, several different types of tissues will form to actually have a single purpose, which will make them an organ. So an organ may actually have multiple functions, but all these tissues together have to be working in synchrony. And then further, all these organs will work together in organ systems in certain events. So for example, the urinary system will be composed of the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder. But the kidney and the bladder are both just individual organs. So today's lecture is basically going to be taking each of these different four adult tissue types and then creating drop-down menu upon drop-down menu upon drop-down menu in your mind. So we're just going to be classifying over and over, getting more and more specific. So if you ever studied botany and you remember Linnaean classification, this is essentially what we're doing here today. So we'll be discussing epithelial tissue, and like I mentioned earlier, it covers all of our exposed surfaces of our body, as well as internal passageways. And it is essentially there to support and protect us. Now, connective tissue has a much more physical support structure in that it fills up internal spaces so there is no big, hollow, empty space. But it's also important for transporting materials and storage of energy. So some types of connective tissue you're probably familiar with are adipose tissue, tendons, ligaments, etc., etc. Muscular tissue is going to help us move, right? We have three types. We have smooth, striated, and skeletal. And these all have different locations and different purposes. And then lastly, we have neural or nervous tissue. And this carries electrical impulses from one part of the body to another. And neurons are the primary cell type that we'll be discussing in detail today. In general, let's talk about epithelial tissue first. The epithelium is a labile tissue, meaning that it's continually replicating. So it's undergoing mitosis continuously, but the rates are gonna vary depending on where this epithelium is. So for example, if you think about your skin, your skin is constantly turning over, right? You have a sunburn and that will heal rather quickly. Now that's actually a lot slower replication rate than some of the cells in our GI tract, which may live for only a day. It also is important because it covers our external surfaces, which makes it a membranous tissue, and provides protection against the elements. It also lines our internal surfaces, which is extremely important for controlling permeability of various solutes and solvents through our mucosa. Glands will be formed by epithelium, and so that will allow for specific secretions to be able to be released either out onto an epithelial surface or into the bloodstream. And it's also important because the epithelium will allow us to sense the world around us. So there will be all sorts of sensory nerves in the epithelium that allow us to detect heat or pain. Here are some of the primary characteristics of epithelial tissue. The first is that it's very cellular. So this means that we have lots of cells packed in one next to the other without other substances in between them. We also have a polarity, which in this case we're talking about, there's an orientation of the cell. So epithelial tissue has effectively a superficial and a deep, not necessarily an up-down, right? Because in anatomic position, the skin on our anterior arm is not up, it would be anterior, right? But it's still going to have a surface that is superficial, which is called the apical surface, and a basal surface, which is deeper. These epithelial cells also attach to one another through a whole variety of mechanisms which we'll discuss. And at the very base of the epithelium, there is a formation called the basement membrane. And this demarcates the difference between the epithelium above and any connective tissue below. Epithelium is also avascular. So that means there are no blood vessels in the epithelium itself. So any nutrients that are going to come into this tissue have to actually diffuse into the tissue via fluids around the epithelial cells. And the last characteristic of epithelial tissue is that it regenerates constantly. It's just always turning over and over and over. Let's classify epithelial tissue a little more specifically now. Membranous epithelia, meaning epithelia that just isn't glandular in nature, has a couple different features to it. The first is that apical and basal surface, right? So it has polarity. So the basement membrane is actually composed of non-living tissue but it is important to demarcate the difference between the epithelial component and 
the basal lamina. The cells are going to adhere to one another through a variety of mechanisms, and there is very little extracellular matrix because this is such a densely cellular tissue type. Also, again, remember it's avascular, so there are no blood vessels in the epithelium. So if you see an image of tissue that has a blood vessel in it, and you're thinking maybe it's epithelial, just you can immediately rule it out right away on any quiz or exam. And then also, uh, it's specialized for things like absorption, secretion, filtration, diffusion, and protection. As we've discussed before, function follows structure, right? So in this case, we have the structure of having more layers of epithelial cells, which will create a greater level of protection in any areas that are subject to friction or assault from chemical elements. There's also permeability that's controlled through the epithelium. So we have a selectively permeable membrane again in our epithelium, so that way only certain substances will pass through into our extracellular fluid. It's also responsible for passing substances through our body and secreting things in both glandular and membranous epithelium. And it absorbs nutrients in water, which is important when you think about our gastrointestinal tract. And again, sensation. Figure 4-2 in your text shows a standard image of a cell that's epithelial. And you can see that there are some features here that you recognize from our lectures last week and some things that are new. So in this case, you see that there is an orientation. This looks like a cell is standing up like a refrigerator so that you have the nucleus down at the bottom and then up at the top we have some cellular extensions like cilia and microvilli, right, which we've discussed before. So the surface that is most superficial, which is up at the top with the cilia and the microvilli, is the apical surface because this is towards the apex. And then down at the very bottom, down at the basement membrane, which separates the cell from any other connective tissues below, is the basal surface. So you will not see cilia or microvilli on the basal surface, but you will see them at the top. Why? Well, let's think about their purpose. Cilia are going to be there to help wave substances along. And then microvilli are there to increase surface area for absorption. So if you could imagine that at the top of this image here, those cilia and microvilli are extending up into the lumen or the opening of our gastrointestinal tract anywhere along the way. Let's talk about hypothetically the duodenum. In the duodenum, those microvilli are going to be very important for absorbing all sorts of nutrients from our food. So you can see a couple other structures that you're familiar with. The Golgi apparatus for one, because remember that the Golgi apparatus is going to be secreting tissue out of the cell. And so in tissues like epithelia, where you have a specific luminal or exterior or superficial surface, that would be the direction the Golgi apparatus would be secreting its product out towards. You'll also notice that there's a separation in the middle of the image between the two different cells. And these are called the lateral surfaces it's just the sides of the cell, basically. And we differentiate them because the lateral surfaces connect to one another, but they don't connect to the basement membrane and they don't connect to the apical surface. The apical surface is different than the lateral surfaces and the basal surface. There are a variety of cellular connections, and these are important because it maintains the integrity of our epithelium. So these connections will hold one cell next to the other. So one of the primary ones is cellular adhesion molecules. These are proteins that essentially will just bind one cell to the next. There are also GAGs or GAGs, <laughs> which are glycosaminoglycans, which are things like hyaluronic acid. And these form a protein sugar like cement and they'll fill in the gaps in between the CAMs or the cellular adhesion molecules. And so what that does is it prevents luminal contents from spilling down in between the epithelial cells. So if you think of it this way, if you have two cells side by side, you need some sort of cement to seal those two bricks, if you will, together. So the gags are going to basically be that glue or cement in between the two bricks, which are the cells. And so that way we don't have things like stomach acid oozing down into the wall because an acid like that could be very irritating and in fact could destroy the integrity of the mucosa. So this is a really important function. Figure 4-3 in your text shows you an overview of the different types of ways that cells join with other cells. In some cases, they'll be joining tightly to not allow any passage of material in between the two cells. In other cases, we'll allow some diffusion of certain things to be able to pass through. In other cases, we're just anchoring that cell down so it doesn't just float away, 
So let's talk about these in a little bit more detail. Tight junctions are found right at the apical regions of epithelial cells, and their purpose is to prevent any luminal contents that are up by the superficial aspect, presumably in the lumen of something like the digestive tract, from getting in between the cells and causing damage. So they're held together with an adhesion belt or a belt desmosome. Epithelial tissues will need to definitely keep certain contents of the lumen in the lumen and not in between the cells, but they also need to communicate in between each other laterally. So for example, in cardiac muscle, one cardiac muscle has to transfer information to the next cardiac muscle to coordinate contraction and to make sure that this happens in unison rather than sporadically. So gap junctions are an important feature because what they do is they allow for diffusion of certain ions and small molecules to pass between the cells via connexons. If you've ever had a sunburn before, you'll have noticed that when you peel and when it heals, it doesn't come off as just a fine powder. It comes off as a broad sheet, right? And this is thanks to desmosomes, which are there to form attachments from cell to cell to prevent any cell separating. So desmosomes are extremely strong and they resist stretching and twisting in all directions. They're also connected to a dense area that's connected to the cytoskeleton in each cell. So this is a really great feature to be able to contribute to its strength. There are two different types of desmosomes and we'll talk about this in the next slide. Figure 4-3 in your text shows you examples of spot desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. But the short of it is that spot desmosomes are just basically these small discs and they connect bands to intermediate filaments and that just helps to stabilize the shape of the cell. So they're just a general structural support. But hemidesmosomes have an additional feature. They're structural, but what they also do is they help to anchor the cell the epithelial cell specifically to the basement membrane so it holds it in place so it doesn't just float away. Which type of cellular connection prevents material from moving between the surfaces of cells to enter the body? Belt desmosomes, hemidesmosomes, spot desmosomes, tight junctions, or gap junctions? So the key part of this question is focusing on between the surfaces of the cells to enter the body. So we're talking about the apical surface first off. So that means we have to be talking about tight junctions because where they are located is right up at the apical aspect of the cell. So they prevent any luminal contents from entering in between the cells into the body. Cilia and microvilli will be found at the blank surface of the cell. The options are A, apical, B, basal, C, lateral, or D, basal lateral. So basal meaning the bottom, we can rule that out because the role of cilia is to wave substances along and microvilli's purpose is to extend the surface area to increase absorption of nutrients and water. So we wouldn't have any need for that when the cells are attached to one another at either the basal, sorry, the basal or the lateral aspects, and therefore, of course, also together, the basolateral aspects. So the answer is A, apical. Next, we'll talk about the classifications of different types of epithelia. This can be a little bit complicated in that there are a lot of different types of epithelia, but nonetheless, it's pretty straightforward and I highly recommend that you take some time to draw this out in your notes, each individual type, and that will help you to keep it clear in your mind the differences between and among the different types of epithelia. When you begin to classify a type of epithelium, you'll want to look at the shape of the cell that is at the free surface, that is the apical aspect, right? So when you look at that, that's going to be the starting point for figuring out which subtype of epithelium we're discussing. So first we'll think about, is it squamous? So squamous cells are kind of squashed flat. And that's important because having a flatter surface means that there is less distance for any type of fluid or solute that would need to diffuse in or out of the cell. So they're much faster diffusion. And then there's also cuboidal cells, which are just like what it sounds like. They are cube is shaped in nature. And this allows for a more selective transport of specific items. We also have columnar cells, which are shaped like tall columns. So these are cells that are taller than they are wide. And these allow chemical reactions to occur as the molecules pass through the length of the cell. And then lastly, we have transitional cells 
cells. And these are a little bit more difficult. They're irregular and they'll transition between shape to shape. So we'll have to look at this a little bit more carefully to make this a little bit more clear. But the point of transitional tissue is that it can stretch without separating. So it's got a very important purpose. We'll discuss that a little bit more coming up. So in addition to looking at the shape of cells at the free surface, we also need to look at how many layers there are of cells. So we'll divide that up into a couple of categories. If there's only one layer of cells, then it's just called a simple epithelium. However, if there is more than one layer, then we'll call it stratified because there are strata or layers of cells. And then lastly, there is something called pseudo stratified and pseudo meaning false. So it's falsely stratified, which means it looks like there's many different layers, but there aren't. It's falsely stratified. There's only one layer and the nuclei actually are at all different levels, but each cell will contact the basement membrane. So the image that you see on the right, which is table 4-1, shows you the difference between squamous, cuboidal, and columnar cells at the apical free surface in the different orientations of either being simple, which is just a simple single one layer, or stratified, where we have many. We're going to talk about this in more detail in the coming slides. Two common places where you'll find simple squamous epithelium is anywhere diffusion or filtration are very important. So endothelium, which is the inner lining of all of our blood vessels, our cardiovascular system, our lymphatic vessels, and also in our respiratory tract and the alveoli, which is the site of gas exchange, and Bowman's cap, sorry, Bowman's capsule in the kidney. These are all sites where we have a lot of diffusion and filtration occurring. So we give the special name endothelium to linings in this area of mucosa that has a simple squamous epithelium. In the serous membranes, for example, the mesothelium, we'll also expect to see a simple squamous epithelium. So what you'll see here is the image that you look at below where you have a sheet of these cells all laid out next to one another. And what we're looking at is the sheet laid out, so you're looking at it from above. This is a different angle than what we looked at previously where we were looking at a cross section showing you up and down of a cell. This is not showing up and down, this is just showing the layout of it side to side. So you can see how they attach one to the other. There's a fair amount of cytoplasm with a single nucleus in each cell that's fairly obvious and easy to see. So you can see both the schematic and the actual light microscopy at the right. And so we'll see a simple squamous epithelium in a lot of different places in our body. Stratified squamous, again, is identified by looking at the very most superficial aspect. So if you look at the top of the two images at the bottom, you'll see that the cells seem squashed down, even though the cells at the bottom seem like they are much rounder. That can be a point where people get confused. So don't look down towards the basement membrane at the bottom of the epithelium where it meets the connective tissue. You want to look up at the free surface, the very top here in this case, and you'll see that those cells are squashed flat. So because they're squashed flat, they're squamous, and because there are multiple layers of these cells, it's stratified squamous. So this is important because anything that has a stratified squamous epithelium is a surface where we're expecting some sort of assault to the tissue, whether it's just friction or whether it's a chemical assault, it's basically there to allow additional protection for the underlying tissue. Stratified squamous epithelium can be subdivided into either keratinized or non-keratinized epithelia. And this is just indicating the presence or absence of keratin, which is the substance that creates our hair, our skin surface, our nails. So it's a firm, dense surface that is acellular. So in the image on the left, you'll see the keratinized sample, which is on the right, has this wide pink band all the way across the top that is absent in the non-keratinized sample. So non-keratinized epithelia has to be kept moist because otherwise it would lose moisture through the apical surfaces. So we'll see non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium in our mucous membranes, so largely in our mouth and in our nose and our nasal cavity. The vagina, esophagus, urethra, and rectum are all non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelia. Now keratinized Stratified squamous epithelia is water resistant, right? So our skin is water resistant, otherwise we would just prune up all the time if we ever got wet. So this keratin protein is very important for protection against both water and abrasion. So keep in mind that the keratin is dead. There is nothing there that's actually alive and it is avascular. So let's discuss another simple type of epithelium. So simple meaning only one individual layer of cells and cuboidal 
they're in the shape of the cube, right? So in this case, you have an image at the bottom right which shows you a single duct. You're looking at a kidney tubule here and on each side of the kidney tubule, there's exactly one cell layer and you see that it is a three-dimensional structure, so that's why it looks like it's kind of two layers on the top. But this is truly just a single cellular tube. So you'll find this type of tissue in kidney tubules, uh, surfaces of the ovaries, salivary glands, and pancreas. And what you want to look at here to be sure that you're looking at a cuboidal cell is the, nu the nucleus. Where exactly is it? In this case, it is right in the dead center of the cytoplasm. So because of that, and that there's a perfect amount of cytoplasm all the way around the nucleus, you know it's not columnar, it's not shaped tall, and it's not squashed flat like a squamous cell. So by default then, if it's a cube-shaped cell in a single layer, you have a simple cuboidal epithelium. Stratified cuboidal epithelium is a rare bird. You're really not going to see this too many times and people don't try to trick you often on tests or quizzes with this because it's a trickier type of tissue to identify. So with a stratified cuboidal epithelium, it's stratified again, meaning multiple different layers, and cuboidal. So that means the cell at the apical surface is cube in nature. So you can expect to see typically only two to three layers of cells. And you'll see this in things like your sweat ducts, salivary glands, and pancreatic ducts. Now transitional epithelium is exactly what it sounds like. It transitions. So it means it starts one way and can become another. So the very best example of transitional epithelium is the lining of the urinary bladder. So we all know that we can sometimes hold a tremendous amount of volume if we really have to in our bladders. And in that case, our bladder is stretched out like a balloon, very, very thin. So the wall becomes thin, and also that means the mucosa, which is the epithelium, it has to stretch and then go back to normal afterwards after we've urinated it as well. So the image that you see here, which is figure 4-5 from your text, shows you the image of when you have an empty bladder versus when you have a full bladder. So with a full bladder, what you have is a much more thinner looking epithelium. But when the bladder is empty, then it can go back to its normal shape, which means that the wall will actually become a little bit thicker. So you'll notice here, you have an irregular surface of cells, and up at the epithelial surface, it's very difficult to tell what you're looking at, right? So if you ever feel like, I don't know what I'm looking at, this looks crazy, it's probably transitional. Simple columnar epithelium is defined as having a single layer of columnar cells. So these columnar cells look like a column, so you can see that they're very tall, and that each cell connects with both the basement membrane as well as the apical surface. So what you see in the images at the bottom are cells that are surfaced at the apical aspect with microvilli, and those are there to increase surface absorption because of surface area being increased. So they're not cilia, keep that in mind. So ciliated simple columnar epithelium may be found lining the uterine tubes because that's going to be helping to propel the egg along the uterine tube towards the uterus. So the function of these simple columnar cells is to both absorb, secrete mucus, and to protect. So what you'll notice in the image on the right is there are some clear looking areas that are kind of difficult to understand what you're looking at there. And those clear looking areas are goblet cells. And those are important because they produce mucus that becomes excreted and then that lines the surface of the epithelium to keep it protected against any acids. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium altogether, great big long name, is a really important one to remember because I know it's a mouthful, but it tells you exactly what it is. Okay, so if you look up at the apical surface here, you have cilia, and the cilia are important for what? Waving things along, right? And if you look at all of those layers, we know we have multiple layers, right? But it also looks very confusing. And the reason why it's confusing is because each of those cells, if you look closely, actually anchors the basement membrane. I mean, it may not look like it in sometimes some of the schematics, but that's actually what's happening. So these are the cells that will line the trachea and the bronchi, and those cilia are really important to help move debris upwards. So if you see cilia on anything that looks like it's maybe multiple layers of cells and you can't quite tell what it is, the cilia are going to be your tip off that you are looking at pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Stratified columnar epithelium isn't terribly common either, 
but nonetheless, it does exist, so let's discuss it. So stratified meaning multiple layers and columnar meaning the cells at the apical surface are oriented like a tall column, right? So these are important for protection and secretion as well, and you're only gonna find it in very specific areas of like the pharynx, the epiglottis, the anus, sweat gland, salivary gland ducts, and also in some mammary glands. Which type of epithelium is found where rapid diffusion takes place, such as in the alveoli of the lungs? Is it A, simple cuboidal epithelium, B, stratified squamous epithelium, C, simple columnar epithelium, or D, simple squamous epithelium? Well, if we're gonna discuss rapid diffusion, we want the fastest possible mechanism, which means the shortest possible distance. So we could rule out anything that would be stratified right away. So there goes option B. So you're down to your three simple options, cuboidal, columnar, or squamous. So columnar are the tallest cells, cuboidal are the middle-sized cells, and squamous are the most squashed flat. So the answer is D, simple squamous epithelium. So which type of epithelium is found lining the stomach and the intestines? Is it A, a simple squamous epithelium, B, a stratified squamous epithelium, C, a simple columnar epithelium, or D, a simple cuboidal epithelium. Well, let's think about what each of these are before we try to just jump to an answer. So we know that squamous cells are small and flat, and so there's not a lot of space for things to have to diffuse through, so they can diffuse through quickly. So the stomach and the intestines don't require that in the same way that, for example, the respiratory system would in the alveoli. So we can rule out A, simple squamous epithelium. And then let's talk about simple cuboidal, because that's the next step up in complexity in the way that we discussed it earlier. So cuboidal cells are slightly larger, but they're typically gonna be found in places like the kidney, and so we can rule that out too. And then we can look at, is it going to be simple columnar or stratified squamous? Well, stratified squamous is going to be there to deal with any type of serious friction or abrasion. So our skin is an example of stratified squamous, so we can rule that out. So that brings us then to C, a simple columnar epithelium. Mucus producing cells of simple columnar and pseudostratified columnar epithelium are called A, mucus cells, B, areolar cells, C, apocrine cells, or D, goblet cells. So trick question, mucus cells and goblet cells are synonyms, so both would totally be acceptable responses. <laughs> Glands are broken down into a couple different categories dependent upon how they release their product. So exocrine glands are those which secrete their product to an epithelial surface. So that may include a duct, but it doesn't require one. A couple examples of exocrine glands are tears, perspiration, and lactation. So for in the example of tears, your lacrimal gland, which is in the lateral aspect of your eye towards the most superior aspect, it is going to release tears via the lacrimal duct which will then drop the tear into your eye so that way fluid can wash away anything that may have got into it. Perspiration is also 
created by sweat glands in your skin. So the product there will be deposited out to the epithelial surface of your skin. And when lactating, mammary glands will produce milk and that milk will travel through ducts to the epithelial surface, which is also skin. Now, endocrine glands are different in that the way that they secrete their hormones is it's into the extracellular fluid and then into the bloodstream. So a couple examples of that would include the thyroid or the thymus and also the testis too for producing testosterone. Glands can be described based upon their structure. So first, let's look at some simple glands. Simple glands are those that don't branch on the way to the gland cells. So first, let's look at simple tubular on the left. What you'll see in this image is purple cells up at the top, which indicate those are epithelial cells. And then down at the bottom, you'll see pink cells, and those are the gland cells themselves. So an example of a simple tubular gland would be intestinal glands. It's important to note, by the way, that in the intestine, you'll also have unicellular exocrine glands like goblet cells, which are important for secreting mucus. In the next image, you'll see a coiled structure. So we have a simple coiled tubular gland. An example of this would be American sweat gland, which produces sweat. The third example is a simple branched tubular. So what you can see is we do have branching, but they all dump into the exact same center area. So this would be an example of a gastric gland or even mucous glands in the esophagus, tongue, or duodenum. In the fourth example, we have simple alveolar or acinar glands. And these aren't anything that we're gonna find in an adult. So this would be something you would see more often when you're looking at embryology textbook because this is one of the early stages of development in the respiratory system as an embryo develops. And then lastly, we have simple branched alveolar. And so you can see here, it looks sort of like a, a clover, really. And an example of this would be a sebaceous gland that secretes oil. Compound glands are those that divide one or more times on its way to the gland cells. So we only have three examples here to look at. There's compound tubular, compound alveolar or acinar, and compound tubulo alveolar, which shares features of both the previous two. So compound tubular, you can see that there are multiple tubes all connecting. And examples of this would be mucous glands in your mouth, for example, or in the testes, we have seminiferous tubules that have the same shape and format. And then also there are bubble urethral glands in the male reproductive system as well that have this same structure. The second or middle structure is compound alveolar or acinar glands. And an example of this would be mammary glands producing milk. The third example is compound tubulo alveolar. And an example of this would be your salivary glands, the glands of the respiratory passages, or also in your pancreas. There are three ways that these glands can all secrete their product. One is merocrine, second is apocrine, and the third is holocrine. And that's listed in order of invasiveness to the cell and the general destruction that it causes. So in merocrine secretion, what's happening is really just exocytosis. So we remember that the Golgi apparatus is going to package up vesicles for exocytosis through the plasma membrane. So this is the perfect example of what a merocrine gland is. An example of this also would be sweat glands producing perspiration. Apocrine secretion includes the loss of some cytoplasm as well as the actual secretory product. So an example would this be mammary glands secreting milk. And then finally, we have holocrine secretion, in which case the whole entire cell goes kaput. The whole cell and holocrine is involved. So when the cell dissolves, all of its products are released. So an example of this would be sebaceous glands in hair follicles. Okay, question time. Which tissue is specialized for rapid diffusion? A, stratified squamous epithelium. B, simple squamous epithelium. C, transitional epithelium. D, pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium, or E, simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. Well, if we're talking about rapid diffusion, what we want is the short, shortest distance between here and there for anything to travel. So in that case, rule out anything stratified or anything that appears stratified. So pseudostratified, transitional, stratified, all those are gone. So that leaves you with two simple epithelium choices. You either have simple squamous or simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. Now, microvilli are important, but not for rapid diffusion. Simple squamous epithelium is the thinnest possible epithelium, so that makes it uniquely well-situated for rapid diffusion. The answer is B. Which tissue is specialized for absorption of large amounts of material per cell? 
A, stratified squamous epithelium, B, simple squamous epithelium, C, transitional epithelium, D, pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium, or E, simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. So stratified squamous epithelium is great for friction, like our skin, for example, so we can rule that out. Simple squamous epithelium can also be ruled out because we know that's the thinnest possible squashed down layer of epithelium possible. So that's great for diffusion, but not for absorbing things. Transitional epithelium is tempting because we know that transitional epithelium is present in the bladder and it allows it to transition from being very full and distended to just back down to normal size. So that's tempting, but the question asks you for large amounts of material per cell, not per the actual organ of the bladder. So we'll rule out C, which brings us to D, pseudostratified columnar ciliated. Well, we don't need cilia necessarily to answer this question, so that might be a distractor. But then we see E, simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. And microvilli's purpose specifically is there to increase surface area. And why would we want to increase surface area? For absorption of water and nutrients. So the correct answer is E, simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. Great news, everybody. If you're noticing that things sound different, it is not just you. I just got a new headset, and I think that this sounds way better. So I'm hoping that you enjoy it as much as I do. So which tissue is specialized for adapting to an organ's change in volume? Is it A, stratified squamous epithelium, B, simple squamous epithelium, C, transitional epithelium, D, pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium, or E, simple columnar epithelium with microvilli? Well, I've kind of given this away before, but transitional epithelium transitions, right? So it adapts to an organ's change in volume. The bladder is the best example of this, and so the answer is C, transitional epithelium. Which tissue is specialized for moving fluid across the surface of the trachea? A, stratified squamous epithelium. B, simple squamous epithelium. C, transitional epithelium. D, pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium, or E, simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. The answer is D, pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium, because the cilia are going to be able to help to move any fluid or substance across the surface of the trachea. Let's move into section 4-4, connective tissue. Connective tissue is kind of an unsung hero in the body in that you don't think of it, people take it for granted, but it's so important. It helps to protect our organs and provides support and stability to everything, so everything stays where it should. So connective tissue is composed of widely scattered cells with a lot of extracellular matrix. An extracellular matrix will oftentimes be abbreviated to an acronym ECM. So we're going to classify connective tissues based on the type of matrix that they produce. Connective tissue is a stable tissue, meaning that it's not constantly turning over like a labile tissue would. So it only undergoes mitosis when needed for growth and repair. So this means that while connective tissues can repair and regrow to some extent, they're not going to be as well suited for it as something like your skin might be. Connective tissue is composed of specialized cells, the extracellular protein fibers such as collagen, elastin, and reticular fibers, and ground substance, which is a flexible matrix, and it's really kind of like a jelly-like mix, and it'll be composed of water, proteins, lipids, and carbs. So we're going to classify connective tissues by the extracellular matrix. So extracellular matrix, by definition, is the extracellular protein fibers plus the ground substance, which is that flexible matrix. So the fibers are going to be classified based upon which type of fiber is predominant, what direction they go, and how many there are, really. And then ground substance will be what type and what amount. So putting that together, it'll help us break down different types of connective tissues into different categories. The three large categories of connective tissue are connective tissue proper, fluid connective tissue, and then supporting connective tissues. So connective tissue proper will include both loose and dense connective tissues. Fluid connective tissue is exactly two things, blood and lymph and nothing else. So these are the only things that are connective tissues that are actually fluids. And then thirdly, supporting connective tissues. So these are things like cartilage and bone. Let's break down connective tissues into all the different categories. This is section four hyphen five. 
Connective tissue proper is what you think of when you think of connective tissue. You don't think of blood, lymph, bone, or cartilage, right? So connective tissue is everything that is not those. So you can break that down into either loose connective tissue or dense connective tissue, which is exactly what you think it is. So loose connective tissue is there's more ground substance and fewer fibers. And dense connective tissue is there's more fibers and less ground substance because it's denser. So loose connective tissues include things like adipose tissue, which is, you know, soft and mushy, right? It's fat. And then dense connective tissues are things that are very strong, like tendons and ligaments. So both of these are going to have a mostly fibrous matrix. And the fibers are going to be arranged in different patterns dependent upon what the function is of the tissue. Now there's only a small amount of ground substance and that's just a mix of proteoglycans and hyaluronic acid and that holds water so that helps to fill spaces in between the cells. When describing connective tissue proper there are a lot of different cell types. So we have fibroblasts that are important because they secrete fibers and hyaluronin. We have fibrocytes which are the stable cells that maintain the matrix. We have fibroclasts, and the difference between clasts and blasts, remember, is that clasts break down and blasts build up. Think blasts build, the two Bs together. So fibroclasts will break down matrix and clean up any old debris. Adipocytes are the cell that is predominant in any type of adipose tissue. So adipocyte is just fat cells, literally translated. Melanocytes are cells that produce melanin, right? So they produce pigment. Lymphocytes are cells that produce antibodies. They're part of our in immune system. We also have macrophages, which are also part of our immune response. And these are really big cells and they're mobile. So they move around through our body and they go to wherever they need to, to eat up anything that could be an invader. They're also mesenchymal stem cells. And these are very important because they can differentiate into a broad number of different types of connective tissue. So they're very important in healing. And mast cells are important too, because they're part of our immune response. So these are white blood cells that will secrete histamine and heparin. And these are both incredibly important chemicals to be released into the immediate tissue to trigger inflammatory responses. Figure 4-9 in your text shows you the cells and fibers in connective tissue proper. Now this is just a general schematic showing you all of the cells together and no particular type of tissue. So you can see that there are thin reticular fibers stretching out. There's also big macrophages. There are plasma cells present. You can see that there are mast cells with all of the little granules or histamine granules, presumably. We also have adipocytes, which are the big yellow cells that look like butter because that's basically what they are. So they're just containing lots of lipid. And we also have mesenchymal cells. Those stellate or star-shaped cells are the stem cells, which will help to rebuild tissue after it's been damaged. The three types of connective tissue fibers are collagen, reticular, and elastin. So collagen fibers are big, pink, long, strong protein ropes, basically. And these will resist stretching in one direction primarily. Reticular fibers are a network that are very thin and fine, and they're kind of interwoven together to create strength. Elastin fibers can be in a number of different directions, and they're branched and wavy looking. So these stretch and recoil to their original length, just like the name, elastin, they're elastic. Loose connective tissues are the packing materials of the body. Basically all these do are filling in all the spots where there isn't something else. And so they fill up space to support blood vessels, our nerves, they store lipids and allow diffusion. So we have embryonic connective tissue in the form of mesenchyme. So stellate stem cells will differentiate to become any other type of connective tissue if needed. So we're not gonna see these in adult tissue. But we will see things like mucus connective tissue or Wharton's jelly in the umbilical cord of a baby. And this is where we're able to harvest stem cells and save them for either our child in the future or to donate them to a bank. So that way these can be available for other children who may, for example, undergo chemotherapy and have a compromised immune system. In that case, having a transplant of this would be tremendously helpful to help them regain their strength after chemotherapy. Areolar tissue is also another type of loose connective tissue, and its primary purpose is just to separate skin from deeper tissue. So if you grab your skin on your arm on the underside and pull it, you'll find that you can pull it, but you can't pull it off entirely. That is thanks to areolar tissue. It's loose, but it's still strong. And adipose tissue is fat, and 
This is important because it not only stores lipids, which has always been kind of understood, but in recent years, we've learned that adipose tissue isn't just metabolically lazy, just hanging out, storing fat. It's actually metabolically active and is constantly re rebuilding and expelling its contents over and over again. So let's look at areolar tissue. So it's loose and it attaches skin to muscle, right? And so it also will attach serous membranes to our body walls and to organs. And so it's an important component of fascia. And so it'll be a superficial packing material that holds thing in place. So if you look at the image below, it's figure 411 in your text. You'll see a schematic on the left and then a light microscopy image on the right. And you'll see all these broad pieces of pink tissue, which are collagen fibers. And then you'll also see a few mast cells in the mix and occasionally even some elastic fibers. So keep in mind with a lot of these connective tissues, you are going to see many different cell types, but the trick is to differentiate what is the most common. In areolar tissue, it is loose, right? We've got to remember that it's primarily more than anything, it is loose. So this is the easiest way to differentiate it from other different types of connective tissues. Adipose tissue is another type of loose connective tissue, and it looks like no other tissue that you're going to see. So you'll notice it looks like there are all these big bubbles, and that's because adipocytes, or fat cells, are filled with lipid, and that lipid is displacing all the rest of the cell. So you see that the nucleus is just pushed over to the side that you can barely find it. So we'll find adipose tissue in, of course, our trouble spots like our abdomen and love handles and thighs, for example, but it's also really important for padding around a lot of our organs, like around our heart or our kidneys. And also it's important for insulation, keeping us warm, serving as protection, and also it's a source of energy. Whenever people mention adipose tissue, what we're really discussing is white fat. That is the most common and most abundant in our bodies, and it stores fat and also absorbs shocks for us. It slows heat loss, which is very important, and it's also metabolically active. But brown fat is a different story altogether. It's much more vascularized, leading to a more brownish color in part, and it also has many more mitochondria. And the reason for this is it can absorb energy from the surrounding tissues and then deliver that energy back to the body on an ongoing basis to help in thermal regulation. So for example, hibernating mammals like a bear, when it's hibernating over the winter, it's probably pretty cold out. They're not going out to eat. So they need energy and warmth over an extended period of time. And that is the purpose of brown fat. Neonates also have this, which is important for them to maintain their temperature as well. Reticular loose connective tissue is composed of thin protein fibers that are woven into a fine mesh. And so all of the organ specific cells will be within that mesh. So really all the reticular fibers are doing is to provide structure. So it's present in the liver, in the lymph nodes, and in the spleen. Dense connective tissues are composed primarily of collagen fibers, and they have very little ground substance or matrix. So we're gonna look at three different types and the direction and types of the fibers are going to help us, of course, break down which tissue type we're talking about. So there is dense regular collagenous, dense irregular collagenous, and elastic tissues in this category. Dense regular collagenous tissue is composed of collagen fibers that are all arranged in one direction, and that's the direction of stress. So tendons and ligaments are examples of this. Tendons will connect muscle to muscle, whereas ligaments will connect ligament to bone. So that's an important distinction. Dense regular collagenous tissue also is poorly vascularized. So any tissue that's poorly vascularized is going to take a long time to heal because it doesn't have the opportunity to gain all of the things that it needs in order to heal. Now, an aponeurosis is a broad, flat, tendinous sheet in this category, and so it's different than a tendon or a ligament, which is more cylindrical. So an aponeurosis will stretch out over a broad area. So examples of this would be, for example, in the large muscles of your skull, or also in your palm, like you see in the image to the right. Dense, irregular collagenous tissue is very different looking than dense, regular collagenous tissue. You can see here that the collagen fibers aren't aligned in a single direction of stress, but rather they're kind of wavy and all over the place. So they're interwoven in a lot of different directions. And what that means is that it can resist stretching in all of those different orientations. So for example, the dermis is a place where you'll find dense, irregular collagenous tissue, as well as in joint capsules and organ capsules.
So the image that you see on the right is one of a spleen that's been lacerated, and this is a very common finding in motor vehicle accidents. So the capsule on the exterior of the organ is composed of dense irregular collagenous tissue. Elastic tissue is composed primarily of elastic fibers with a little collagen in the mix too. So these elastic tissues are interwoven in many different directions in some tissues, but there's also some tissues in which you'll see a unidirectional orientation for the elastic tissues. These will all stretch out and then recoil back to their original length. So some places that you might expect to see elastic tissue would be in the walls of the large arteries. So for example, in the aorta. The aorta has to accommodate changes in blood pressure, so that elasticity is an incredible part of not having your aorta rupture when you go for a run. The trachea also is another location as well as the larynx, and it's also present between erectile tissue and the skin in the penis. There are three different types of fasciae, which are superficial fascia, deep fascia, and subserous fascia. And what these all are really are just connective tissue layers that support and surround different areas. So superficial fascia will be found in the hypodermis, so underneath the skin, and we'll see both areolar and adipose tissue here. Deep fascia is going to be what composes visceral capsules, and it's involved in tendons and muscles, and it's composed of dense connective tissue. Subserous fascia is going to be in between the deep fascia and the serous membrane, and it's composed of alveolar tissue. Figure 413 in your text demonstrates how all three types of fascia can be shown in this one image here. Let's move on to fluid connective tissues, section 4-6. So as I mentioned before, there are only two fluids that qualify as fluid connective tissue, and that's blood and lymph. And so this is a fluid matrix with specialized cells. So what is lymph? Well, lymph comes from blood plasma, and it's formed by the interstitial fluid that enters into the lymphatic vessels. So once that fluid starts circulating, then immune cells use that to transport so they can monitor and respond to any external threats. Lymph is also very important in maintaining homeostasis for our bodies because this is a site where nutrients, toxins, waste, and blood volume can all be monitored and adjusted. Blood is primarily water, so it's a watery matrix called plasma, and in the blood, in that watery matrix, we have three formed elements, red blood cells, abbreviated RBCs, white blood cells, WBCs, and platelets. So blood is gonna be carried by arteries away from our heart to our tissues and veins to return deoxygenated blood back to our heart. And so the blood pressure is going to force water and solutes into capillaries, which is where that exchange occurs. So any nutrients and water can be pushed into the interstitial fluid around cells to allow diffusion and other transport mechanisms. So blood pressure is pushing blood with its contents to all of our distal cells so that way our distal cells can obtain nutrients from it. Well, that was quick and painless. Let's get into section four hyphen seven, cartilage and bone. Cartilage is something you may have called gristle as a child when eating chicken. And what it is is a firm gel that contains chondroitin sulfates. So microscopically, when we look at cartilage, we have chondrocytes. So chondros, cartilage, and sites being cells. So these are cartilage cells. And that is the only cell that is present in the matrix. The chondrocytes are going to be housed in lacuna and cartilage is a vascular. So you can tell right away if it's going to be a vascular, it's going to have a very hard time healing. So there is something called anti-angiogenesis factor present, which prevents blood vessels from forming. And this has actually been a recent point of interest in cancer research and was revealed by Dr. Judah Folkman. And the image that you see at the bottom here demonstrates how angiogenic, sorry, angiogenic tumors can request blood supply to them. So by the tumor releasing these chemicals into the surrounding tissue, blood vessels will actually grow around a tumor to be able to provide it with a blood supply so that way it can grow. So he actually tested this by putting a small tumor into a rabbit's eye, which is not expected to find any blood vessels in this one specific part of the cornea. And then, sure enough, blood vessels started running in from all different directions. You could see it happening before your very eyes without any type of enhancement. So 
all these blood vessels grow towards the tumor so it allows the tumor to grow but if you treat somebody with an angiogenesis inhibitor it stops blood vessels from forming the blood vessels will regress and then in so doing the tumor is losing its nutrition and therefore involutes and shrinks so cartilage is going to be surrounded by a fibrous perichondrium peri around and chondria cartilage right so there's a fibrous perichondrium that is composed of two different layers there is an outer layer that is composed of dense irregular connective tissue and then an inner cellular layer and that inner cellular layer is incredibly important because the cells are there to help to produce growth and some minor repair Hyaline cartilage is my favorite because I think it's a really beautiful type of tissue to look at microscopically. But you're also talking to a nerd who bought her own microscope in grad school when I took graduate histology because I loved it so much. So you really can't see any of the collagen fibers when you look at hyaline cartilage. It looks like this like amorphous pink background, which we call glassy. So we have our chondrocytes in the lacuna that you can see there. And this is the most abundant type of cartilage that you're going to see in the human body. You'll find it in our costal cartilages in our ribs, articular cartilage, and also in our trachea. So the articular cartilage component is important because that is subject to wear and tear. So people who go and run marathons all the time are really grinding away that the articular cartilage in their knees. And of course, it's difficult for cartilage to regrow because it's avascular. Hyaline cartilage also, by the way, is a precursor to bone in the embryonic skeleton. In elastic cartilage, the most prominent type of fiber is elastin. You guessed it. <laughs> so that makes it, of course, very flexible. So examples of places you might expect to see elastic cartilage are going to be in the oracle of your ear, the outer ear, and also in your larynx. Fibrocartilage is extremely tough. The name tells you that. Fibro meaning fiber and cartilage, it's fibrous cartilage. So the collagen fibers are very prominent and they are bundled together for strength. It makes it incredibly durable. So it is in places where we really need structure. So for example, our intervertebral discs, also the pubic symphysis and the menisci of our knee. Now keep in mind our intervertebral discs are there to pad and cushion our vertebra. So that's incredibly important and also is of note to me because I've herniated a disc in my neck at a certain point in my life and required surgery because one of my intervertebral discs bulged out and impinged on a nerve lateral to it, requiring emergency surgery. So that fibrocartilage, although strong, is not totally indestructible. Cartilage can grow in one of two methods. One is interstitial growth and the other is appositional growth. So in interstitial growth, we have cartilage that grows from within. So the daughter cells of the chondrocytes are going to produce additional matrix as you see in image A above. So by dividing, they're producing more matrix from within. In appositional growth, it's kind of the opposite because what's happening is the cells are producing more and more cartilage that is on the outer surface, kind of like a shell. So interstitial growth is what contributes to the majority of the mass of our cartilage in our bodies, but neither of these two things occur in adults. This is only a developmental mechanism. Which connective tissue has a fluid extracellular matrix? A, blood, B, dense regular fibrous tissue, C, areolar tissue, D, adipose tissue, or E, elastic cartilage? Well. There's only one of these that's fluid, so the answer is A, blood. Which tissue has a glassy extracellular matrix with a slick surface to facilitate movement in joints? Is it A, osseous tissue, B, dense regular fibrous tissue, C, adipose tissue, or D, hyaline cartilage? Well, A, osseous tissue is bone, so that's not going to be it. Dense regular fibrous tissue would be things like tendons or ligaments. So while that helps with movement, it's not in joints. Adipose tissue is obviously important for a million reasons, but has nothing to do with movement in our joints. And hyaline cartilage, that is the wear and tear component of our joints. So the answer is D, hyaline cartilage. All right, let's talk about bone, which is also known as osseous tissue. So bone is calcified by a collagen protein matrix with calcium phosphate. So the calcium phosphate helps to calcify the bone. The osteon is the functional unit of bone, but the osteon is not a single cell. 
An osteon is actually composed of several cells. So each osteocyte is an individual cell. And as you can see in the image below, the image on the left is showing you that there are multiple osteocytes in the lacuna, which is similar to chondrocytes, right? And it is all structured in concentric circles, it looks like, around a central canal. If you're looking at different textbooks or images, you may find the name Haversion Canal as a synonym for central canal. So the bone is very vascular, but keep in mind, it's going to be tricky to be able to get fluids and nutrients in. So we have a system called canaliculi, which are these finger-like extensions that allow for the exchange of vascular fluids and nutrients and things like that. So bone is surrounded by periosteum, meaning around the bone. And it has two layers, a fibrous outer and cellular inner, just like we discussed previously in cartilage. And we also have two different types of bone. We have compact and cancellous bone. And compact is the dense cortex that you'd expect to see in most bones. And cancellous is just another word for spongy. Section 4-8, tissue membranes. While we talked about mucous membranes previously in earlier chapters, you probably have a different understanding of what a mucous membrane is now that we've discussed cellular biology in the previous chapter and epithelium in this chapter. So mucous membranes are those that line cavities that are open to the outside world, like our mouth, for example. And it has areolar tissue in it to support it that has a different name. We call it lamina propria when we refer to the areolar tissue in the mucous membrane. So either mucus or fluid is going to be responsible for protecting our mucous membrane. And you'll find this in our digestive tract, our respiratory tracts, urinary and reproductive tracts. So mucous membranes are everywhere. Serous membranes now are closed membranes. So there is no communication with the outside world in any way. The inner layers of a serous membrane are going to be epithelial, but the outer layers are connective to give us some rigidity and strength. So in the cavity between the layers, it's filled with a watery serous fluid, hence the name serous membrane. And of those, we have layers that are both visceral and parietal, thinking parietal is peripheral and visceral on the viscera. The cutaneous membrane is effectively skin. So it is totally epithelium covering the exterior surface of our body. Now our skin doesn't produce mucus, thank goodness, or we would all be goopy. And it is composed of a stratified squamous epithelium. So that way, if we bump up against something, we don't immediately desquamate and bleed. So that stratified squamous epithelium is very important for us to be able to walk around, wear clothing, and live in the world without falling apart. It's also thick and waterproof to some extent. Synovial membranes have the unique responsibility for creating synovial fluid, which cushions joints, which another word for joint is articulation. So around certain joints, we'll have a fibrous capsule, and that is what is filled with the synovial fluid to allow padding in between the two. So think of this as basically a water-filled balloon in between two bones. So if you have two bones pushing on opposite ends of the water balloon, you'll see the water would kind of push out on opposite directions. And that's exactly the way a synovial membrane functions full of synovial fluid. So the synovial joint is requiring movement to make sure that we prevent degeneration. So you'll see that there's a note in your textbook that indicates that people who are bedridden and don't move around very much will end up having joint degeneration. And this is a very important reason why when we have patients who are either on bed rest or who are comatose, that we will actually move them to make sure that they don't have joint degeneration. Synovial membranes have two different layers. There's an areolar tissue layer and also an atypical epithelium. And the reason that's atypical is it's not like normal epithelium. So first off, there is no basement membrane to separate the epithelium from the subcutaneous tissue. There are also up to one millimeter gaps in between the cells. Now think about that. That's kind of crazy, right? Like all the other epithelial tissues, they are packed in tight next to each other. They are hypercellular. There are desmosomes and hemidesmosomes and gap junctions, tight junctions, all of these things to hold cells together tightly and to only allow certain specific things to diffuse. But in synovial membranes, there can be up to a millimeter of space in between the two. So that's pretty fascinating. But keep in mind, this is a closed in unit to the world, right? There's no outside influence. So we have less risk of things like infection.
Now, fluids and solutes are constantly going to be exchanged back and forth between the capillaries and the synovial fluid. So this is always an active process of generation and filtration, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let's talk about muscle tissue now. Section 4 hyphen 9. So what does muscle tissue do? Well, it allows us to move. So as the cells contract, it generates force to allow us to have strength to be able to do things like to bring our hand up to our shoulder or to lift weights. Muscle tissue is a permanent tissue, meaning that after we're born, there is really little to no mitosis whatsoever. So again, this means that any tissue that's permanent is going to have a very difficult time regenerating if injured. There are three types of muscle, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. We'll differentiate between these in the coming slides. Skeletal muscle, or skeletal muscle, which is the way I learned it when I was in school, is what you think of when you think of muscles, right? There are all the things that move your arms and legs. These are voluntary. If you want to, you can close your eyes, you can move your arm or leg in any direction by choice. You have conscious control over it. And when you look at it microscopically, you can see the image on the right in the light microscopy that there are actually striations in it. So striation is just another word for stripes. So we refer to skeletal muscle as voluntary striated muscle. It's also multinucleated, meaning there are many different nuclei throughout the cell, and they're all scattered around the edges. And skeletal muscle cells can be incredibly long. So we will actually talk about a skeletal muscle fiber more than a cell per se, because an individual fiber may have multiple different cells within it. There is something called myosatellite cells, which are really just stem cells. And what they'll do is they'll help to rebuild new muscle fibers as needed. Although keep in mind, muscle cells being part of a permanent tissue body will not regenerate very easily. Cardiac muscle is found specifically and only in the heart. And it is similar in some ways to skeletal muscle in that it is striated. So you can see it down at the light microscopy image on the right, the striations are present, except instead of being multinucleated, there's only one or two nuclei per cell. It's also involuntary. You can't close your eyes and control your heart rate no matter how hard you try. So for this reason, we call cardiac muscle striated involuntary muscle. And there is one feature in cardiac muscle that is not present in skeletal muscle or smooth muscle. So it is pathognomonic for cardiac muscle. If you see it, you know you're only looking at cardiac muscle. It cannot be anything else. And that is intercalated discs. They're oftentimes abbreviated IDs. But anyway, so intercalated discs are those vertical lines that you see that are perpendicular to the long axis in both the schematic and the actual light microscopy image below. Pacemaker cells are a part of the heart that set the rate for our heart to beat. So they set the pace for all the muscles to contract. And we're going to get into this process in 206. But for now, you just need to know that pacemaker cells are what is responsible for regulating the heart rate. Smooth muscle is different from cardiac and skeletal muscle. You can see that the cells are laid alongside one another, but they're different looking. So first off, we don't have any intercalated discs, right? There are none of those horizontal lines in between the long axis of the cells. There are also no striations. It's totally smooth. So this is worth comparing so you can differentiate easily between the three. Smooth muscle is also involuntary. You cannot make it contract if you want to. So you can find smooth muscle, for example, in the uterus. So women can try <laughs> as long as you like. You cannot make your uterus contract if you want to. That is what we mean by involuntary. It's also present in parts of our GI tract as well. We are almost there, everyone. Let's head into section 4-10 and talk about nervous tissue. You're going to love nervous tissue because it's so straightforward. Just like when we talked about the fluid connective tissues being either blood or lymph, when we talk about nervous tissue, you have only two cells you need to know, neurons and neuroglia. So neurons are what you think of when you think about how do we think? How do we carry electrical signals called action potentials? That's all neurons. Neuroglia is like the cleanup crew that runs around and takes care of neurons. So they're there to support the neurons and to repair and provide nutrients. And they're just kind of hanging out. They're not really part of our thinking process at all. So neurons are structured with one or more receiving dendrites that will receive an action potential, a cell body then that will transmit it out to an axon that will send that message out to other different cells, other neurons specifically. <laughs> 
Nervous tissue is permanent tissue, meaning that after we're born, there's really no mitosis that occurs. So if no further cells develop, if we damage any brain tissue, it's unlikely to ever be repaired. Now, there are advances in science that are trying to address this, but it, it's really limited, to be honest with you. And then on top of that, keep in mind that you have alternative pathways that if you do lose function of a certain part of your brain, it's possible to regain that capacity through alternate pathways. So for example, I have an uncle who back around the time I was born had a terrible car accident. He was in a coma for months and he had to learn to walk, talk and eat all over again. And he did. I mean, he totally did. You would never know that he had this terrible brain injury because he was able to learn all of these things. So our neurons are really incredible, and we'll talk more about this in coming chapters. Here's an image of nervous tissue showing you the difference between neurons and neuroglia. So in the light microscopy image at the top left, you'll see the major structure occupying the majority of the image is a neuron. So in the very dead center, we have the nucleolus in the nucleus. And then we have the cell body around it that you can identify. All those little tiny dots that you see floating around in the strata around it are neuroglia. Those are our supporting cells that help phagocytose things and also to provide nutrients to the neurons. And if you look down further to the bottom of the image, you'll see a classic image of your standard neuron. And you'll notice on the left end, by the biggest part of it where we have the cell body and the nucleus, there are all those different structures extending off of it, and those are dendrites. And dendrites are all receivers. And so they will receive action potentials, bring that into the cell body, and then send it out towards the right on the axon, which is that single long tail. And that axon is gonna conduct that information out towards other cells. Section 411, injuries. In any health science program, you're going to delve into the inflammatory cascade in great detail. And typically, you will hear that there are four cardinal signs of inflammation, and those are what you see listed here in blue. Redness, heat, swelling, and pain. And in Latin, they're called ruber, calor, tumor, and dolor in order. And so what's happening here is we have redness that arises because we have increased blood flow to an area. And because we have that increased blood flow, that also creates more heat on the area. So if you put your hand on somebody's arm where they have an inflammatory process, it will be both red and warm. There's also swelling that will occur, and that's in part from the increased blood flow. But more than that, it's because we have increased permeability of our blood vessels that occurs in an inflammatory process. And altogether, those are going to trigger nerve endings to cause pain. But the fifth sign of inflammation is that it results in a disturbance of function. Whatever tissue it is can't operate normally because it's undergoing this inflammatory process. Figure 4-21 shows you a general overview of what happens in an inflammatory process. So let's say that hypothetically there's some sort of infection that arises, in which case mat cells, which are floating around in your bloodstream, they will get to that area and when they arrive, what they'll do is they will release several hormones and chemicals like histamines, heparin, prostaglandins. And when they release this into the surrounding tissue, it triggers a whole cascade. So it starts off with vasodilating, which opens up the blood vessels so that way they can hold more blood. And that's great because by bringing more blood to the area, we're able to bring in more white blood cells and other helpers that will help to heal whatever it is we're trying to address. And then after that, we also have an increase in the permeability of the walls and the capillaries. So normally, our blood pressure would force different nutrients and fluid through the capillaries into the interstitial fluid, so that way distal cells can receive all that information. But in order to get all of that good stuff to an area that's been damaged or injured, the capillaries basically open up to take more. So as a result, all sorts of fluid is going to swell into that area. And so now you have swelling and redness because of that increased blood flow and the increased fluid. And all of that in turn triggers your nerve endings to be stimulated and that gives you pain. So that is the overall pathway of how inflammation works in a nutshell. We've talked a lot in this lecture about which tissues can and which tissues can't repair themselves, and that's something to note as you study. Some other terms you should know about tissue repair include necrosis, 
And necrosis is tissue destruction or dying, basically. And pus is what's formed when we have debris and dead cells and other tissue components that are necrotic all together. So you've seen pus, I'm sure. At some point in your life, you've fallen down, you've skinned your knee, and you see that yellow, opaque material. That is pus. It is a purulent exudate that is trying to help clean the wound. And if that pus ends up localized in an area and can't get exposed to the outer world to drain away, we develop what's called an abscess, which is basically a pocket of pus, more or less. Also, tissue can regenerate, hopefully, but not all types can. Um, but if a tissue regenerates, then we're great, right? The tissue goes back to functioning normally, it looks normal, everything's fine. But that's not always the way it works. So if you fall down, you skin your knee, you may not end up with a totally normal piece of skin there. If it's a really bad injury, you may end up with a scar. And so a scar can be called either a cicatrix or also fibrosis. Fibrosis being the abnormal condition of fibrous tissue. So you know that when you look at scar tissue, that it's dense, it's like kind of pinky white, it's firm, it's different than the surrounding skin. And that's because it's made of collagen, it's connective tissue. So we have connective tissue replacing epithelial in replacement. Lastly, section 4-12, aging. Aging is generally unpleasant. Everything I'm about to list sounds awful, right? So <laughs> when you age, your epithelia are all going to become thinner. So that means that we're subject to a lot of different things. Things may permeate that shouldn't, or skin may tear, for example. Connective tissue also becomes more fragile and our bones become more brittle. So a process called osteoporosis, which is kind of a normal part of aging, can also be pathologic if it's severe or too early. And in general, also, just the nature of osteoporosis is such that our bones become more brittle and more fragile. So when that happens, we're more likely to have fractures. And having a hip fracture is one of the largest reasons why people end up staying in a nursing home indefinitely. It creates a cascade of events by which once you break your hip, you end up in the hospital, you either contract a bed sore or some other illness just by virtue of the fact that you're in a hospital and you're exposed to all this different illness and things sort of start to tank at that point for a lot of people. So breaking a hip in and of itself, not a big deal. It happens, but the sequela that can occur when somebody is already older and has a different homeostatic set point than say you or I might in our 20s, 30s, 40s, um, it can be very damaging and very deadly. Cancer incidence also increases with age, and 70 to 80 percent of all cancer cases are going to result from chemical exposure, environmental factors, or a combination of the two. Now, your text doesn't mention this, but there's something called a two-hit hypothesis that's pretty commonly understood, and what this means is that most cancer cases arise from two hits. So the first hit might be that you're exposed to some chemical. But the second hit might be that you have a genetic predisposition to that type of cancer in the first place. So somebody who, for example, doesn't have that genetic predisposition might have the same exposure, but they might not develop cancer. So that two-hit hypothesis is an important point for when you have a conversation with somebody who says, well, my grandfather smoked every day of his life since he was 13 until he was 92, and he never developed cancer, so I'm sure it's just fine. Well, not necessarily. Your grandfather was probably blessed with fantastic genes and was very lucky, but then there are plenty of people for everyone like that grandfather who does have the genetic susceptibility and you don't know it until you get the cancer. There's no way to really know this at this point. So it's altogether possible that somebody who smokes for five years could have the exact opposite situation where they're very vulnerable to that chemical exposure and they develop a malignancy early. Anyway, that's my great news ending for you. So anyway, thank you so much, everyone. These are the references that I've used for the lecture today. You can see, of course, I've drawn on our textbook, but I've also pulled in a few other images because I really just wanted to build it up a little bit more for you without bogging you down. So these are the references if you'd like to check them out. Again, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for staying with me through to the end. I very much appreciate your attention. If you have any questions, please email me. I'm happy to Zoom with you. I would love to see your faces other than just on your data sheets. So please do reach out to me with any questions whatsoever. And I hope that you did great on exam one. And I will talk to you soon.